Let's look at life history strategies. Life history is the schedule of an organism's life, including its age when it's mature, able to reproduce, the number of reproductive events it has in its life, how it allocates energy to reproduction, how many and how big are the offspring, and also what is the lifespan of that individual. These illustrations of the March Hare are here because the March Hare in Alice in Wonderland was always in a hurry. Life history traits are features of an organism's life cycle that influence its lifespan and reproductive success such as the things we mentioned before, age at first reproduction, the number of offspring per reproductive episode, and how much time passes between those reproductive episodes. For any organism, those traits shape the pattern of its life table and determine its population growth rate, little r. Since fitness depends on producing successful offspring, Many life history traits relate to reproduction, maturity, age at first reproduction, parity, that is the number of reproductive episodes, fecundity, how many offspring per episode, or bout, we sometimes call episodes bouts, and what is the total length of the life of the organism. In an idealized world, we could envision a perfect organism that would begin reproducing as soon as it's born and lives forever. That is the organism that could have the maximum reproduction. However, this kind of organism does not exist. There are two extremes in life histories, semiparity and iteroparity. Semiparous organisms reproduce only once during their life. At the end, they live, mature to some maximum size, and then reproduce, putting a lot of energy into reproduction. Examples of organisms like this are salmon, the century plants are agaves, and bamboo. And this kind of reproduction we sometimes call Big Bang reproduction. The other extreme or alternative is iteroparity, which is reproducing repeatedly during the life cycle, and many more organisms are like this, including humans. So why do life histories vary? They can vary among species, among populations of the same species also. They likely vary because of inherited patterns of reproductive biology and also the influence of the environment. For example, let's look at the number of offspring in a reproductive bout for birds, known as clutch size. Most seabirds, gannets, petrels, some gulls, lay only one egg per reproductive bout. Hummingbirds, making very tiny little nests of spider web and lichens on the underside of leaves, usually have two eggs. Muscovy ducks, the kind we see around our lakes and canals here in Miami, may lay eight to ten eggs. Why this variation? The ornithologist David Lack of Oxford first placed life histories in an evolutionary context, looking at the differences he saw between tropical and temperate zone songbirds. He noticed that tropical songbirds laid fewer eggs per clutch, whereas temperate laid more. And he speculated that this difference was based on the different abilities to find food for their chicks. So this is something I want you to think about. Why can temperate songbirds find more food for their chicks than their tropical counterparts. Clutch size corresponds to the number of eggs that the parents can successfully rear. And in an experiment done with magpies, adding and subtracting eggs from the nest shows that seven is the magic number. The greatest number of chicks fledged left the nest 
to become independent when the number of eggs in the nest was seven. It's interesting to see that the most common clutch size in a number many species is not necessarily the most productive. In this bird species, we can see that there are more clutches. The greatest number of clutches have eight or nine eggs per nest, but nests with 12 or more eggs show the largest percentage of surviving young. If we look at all organisms, we can make some generalizations and also see that some life history traits are associated. Organisms that develop slowly take a long time to reach sexual maturity and have a low reproductive rate are also those who invest heavily as parents in their offspring. And some examples of this are oak trees with their relatively big seeds, elephants, long time gestation, and the offspring spends several years with their mothers, and giant tortoises, many other examples, versus organisms that develop quickly, reach sexual maturity very early, have a very high reproductive rate, and don't invest much in their offspring. Examples of this include mice, fruit flies, and weedy plants. So let's consider what are some of the costs of reproduction in Cardinals, beautiful bright red birds we see around our houses. Hibiscus, also these flowers can be red, though this clip art makes it look black. And then finally let's consider humans. It is impressive. We think we're the most caring of all the mammals, but parental investment in elephants rivals that of humans. Parents who care for their offspring sacrifice their own health and longevity very often. In this experiment with a raptor, the effects on males and females are both negative, although a little more negative on, on females. By removing chicks from the nest, females and males both live longer than those who had control nests with the regular clutch size. And when chicks or eggs were added to the nest requiring more care, the adult survival decreased for both males and females. For all organisms, fecundity is directly correlated with mortality. So the more offspring an individual has, the sooner it will die. In a population, the more individuals reproduce, the greater their mortality. And this is generalizable to all species.